Rogers. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> and uh, thank you so much, Don, for your invitation to, to speak with everybody. I would say uh, we're going we're gonna to do something totally different uh, for, for a minute here. <clears throat> so yes, the, I gave away the, the sort of story um, already when I told you what's going to be, this is going to be about birds and, and fungi and fungal dispersal. Um, so I want to say a, cup, a couple of things before I sort of dive right in. I want to mention that this work is, uh, is primarily a collaboration between myself and my PhD student, Marcos Cayafa, who, and the work is, is from Chile and he's Chilean and he's about to graduate. So um, a, a, a big positive thank you to Marcos for all of his hard work. He's, he's done a great job with this work. And then also I want to acknowledge um, Michelle Husino, who's going to be soon at the US Forest Service and was a postdoc in our lab. And her uh, sort of experience working with birds and her expertise with, with metagenomics are both been critical for the work I'm going to present. Certainly, there are many other people who uh, contributed, and I'm going to mention them at the end, but these two are, are I want to mention up front. And as Don said, um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about mycorrhizae. So I'm going to talk about some other fungi, but I'm going to primarily talk about ectomycorrhizal fungi. And I think for this group, I won't spend very much time introducing you to this uh, symbiosis between uh, vascular plants and ectomycorrhizal fungi, because I think everybody knows probably a lot about that. But I do want to mention that <clears throat> most studies of ectomycorrhizal fungi in plants are really primarily have, have taken place in the northern temperate zones. And if you look at this uh, map that sort of traces back to 200 million years ago, we're really talking about Laurasia. And so uh, it's, it's really, a, so far, the vast majority of our studies are in Laurasia or former Laurasia. And they also really focus on primarily a couple of plant families, especially Pinaceae and Phagaceae, but also Betulaceae. The vast majority of what we know about ectomycorrhizal fungi in plants comes from those systems. So we're going to take a trip to somewhere totally different. <clears throat> Uh, so we're going to talk about ecosystems that are from the former Gondwana. And this is what Gondwana looked like about 200 uh, million years ago. And of course, South America uh, figures very prominently, but also this connection between South America, Antarctica, and Australasia, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of come back to several times. Another really important thing that I want to mention up front is that this guy right here shown in these pictures, Dr. Donald Feaster was instrumental to me getting started working um, in South America and being interested in the biogeography of the fungi from South America. Um, this was from my first trip to former Gondwana with Don in 2008 when I was a postdoc. And so I just wanna say thanks to you, Don, for getting me hooked on Gondwanan fungi and also for all of your support and mentorship, not only for the field of mycology, but in my case, specifically for me and putting up with me as a postdoc. So thank you very much. And thank you for joining me on other trips as well. So I hope we'll get a chance to go back. Um, so just a quick shout out to Don. All right, so there's a, relatively a, a lot we know about the animals and plants from the former Gondwana. Um, and this is a really nice paper from 2004 that homes in on the biogeography of the plants and animals, at least what was known to that time. And there's a couple patterns that really stand out when you look at the sort of big picture connections between South America and these other places. And I would say the main and most obvious one is that <clears throat> the biota of South America is really divided by latitude. And that's an idea I'm gonna come back to multiple times. Uh, and then the other thing is that Southern South America is really similar both in plants and animals these, these biogeographic connections are quite strong between Southern South America and Australasia. Uh, this has been less documented for the fungi, but we already know that, that there's some connections and I'll talk about that. And when we talk about um, South America's ectomycorrhizal plants, which are of course the habitat for ectomycorrhizal fungi, we see also there's really strong divisions by latitude. And so I've given you a, a highly simplified sort of picture of the ectomycorrhizal plants in South America. And we're gonna focus on Nothophagaceae down here, but you also see there's some Northern temperate elements that make it into South America. So Quercus humboldtii and um, Ulnus, uh, which are sort of going down the Cordillera of the Andes and then tropical ectomycorrhizal legumes in the Guiana Shield and also down into Amazonia. 
And there are some other ectomycorrhizal plants uh, I've listed there, but I would say those are dispersed and they're low density. So they're not canopy trees. We're really talking about the ones that are forming stands and whole canopies made of ectomycorrhizal plants. So because these are the, the habitats for the fungi that I'm often the most interested in, I'm gonna focus on those. Um, the Nothophagaceae is restricted in South America to this southern end. There are somewhere around 10 species, depending on who you ask, and they're endemic to Chile and Argentina. And these are really the only ectomycorrhizal trees in these forests in southern South America, um, except where, where there's introductions or an occasional Salix Humboldtia. Um, and so it, as you get further south in southern South America, these trees become 100% of the canopy in many forests. And there's also some endangered species, especially in the north, which I'm not going to talk about. Another important thing to note is that it's really well established for Nothophagaceae, this temperate Gondwana distribution. You find Nothophagus and Nothophagaceae distributed across Australasia and Southern South America. And we infer from fossil data that when the planet was warmer, that Antarctica was essentially covered by Nothophagaceae forests. So we know that they've been important in the long run uh, for this part of the world. Okay, so they form these big canopy trees. They're lovely. They get quite large in some cases. This is Nothophagus dombe from Chile. And now, because people have been interested in the fungi, of course, and there's more and more work on the fungi associated with these trees, uh, we know something about the fungal community. So I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I, uh, we have done some work in my lab and collaborated with a number of other South American collaborators to document some of these things. And so this nice paper um, by Camille Trong as the lead author from sort of our lab group and collaborators really shows nicely that the ectomycorrhizal communities are highly dominated by Cortinarius. There's just tons of Cortinarius. This picture of this Cortinarius bouquet is uh, from a collection that I took in about 20 minutes in an area that's maybe 30 meters by 40 meters. And so you can see just visually, there's a lot of Cortinarius and they made up between a quarter and a third of all of the fungi that we collected in terms of the OTU. So I think I'll convince you by the end of this talk that Cortinarius is important in, in this region. There's also this really strong temperate Gondwanan origin signature um, and that's been documented before, but I would say we've, we've sort of solidified that even more with some of the work that we've done. So you get things like Ostropaxillus and Descolia that are essentially uh, inferred to be of Southern temperate Gondwana origin. And then in some cases they extend out of the uh, South and in some cases they don't. Also Geomorium, which we described as a new family Geomoraceae, which is sister to Tuberaceae. And Geomorium lineage is only in South America. And here's some others as well. The point is there's this temperate Gondwana origin in the trees and also in those fungi as well. And when you go out in these forests and you're like me and you're sort of obsessed with truffles, you dig around and you find there's like a lot of different truffle fungi out there as well. And you can see just visually um, and sort of if you know the fungi at all that these are from different, different taxonomic and phylogenetic groups. And of course, that's just something I'm interested in because I'm interested in those here. And so when I go there, I'm like, wow, there's a lot. Okay, so what's going on with that? Why, why are we focused on that? Well, we know uh, Kabir set up the talk nicely yesterday. He talked a lot about dispersal and we know dispersal is critical. And so, uh, you know, you've got this Cordinarius mushroom here. Many mushrooms, most mushrooms have uh, these airborne spores that are deposited. So they have a chance to disperse away from, from their fruiting body in a pretty obvious way. But of course, there's some fungi that don't have an obvious way to get their spores to somewhere else. And the truffle fungi uh, are notable and also these cicodioids. And we have a lot of these uh, that are cordinarius in this system and I'll show more pictures as well. So we know that dispersal has consequences and I won't uh, belabor the point too much but I do think it's important to point out that you get sort of this diverse species pool with local communities and dispersal is often involved in formulating what happens in these local communities. So we know it structures communities. Dispersal is important because it impacts the population dynamics of individual species. And certainly according to any, uh, almost any of your favorite 
ecological theories like the ones shown here, that dispersal is critical to generating the variability that we see and generating sort of a community diversity. And of course, for ectomycorrhizal fungi, Kabir talked about it and his work has really shown that ectomycorrhizal fungi are dispersal limited and the dispersal impacts both the fungal communities and also then feeds back to influence the plants as well. So, so I think there's a lot of evidence for that and I'm not gonna really go into more detail. So going back to the truffles, uh, you know, this obvious question that people always ask me when I give talks about truffles is, well, how do they disperse their spores? So this is an undescribed South American um, Pisiza species so, uh, in the broad sense. And you know, what it, how does this thing get its spores out there? And the short answer is that we really know that in the Northern hemisphere, at least, animals tend to smell the truffles, they dig them up and then they eat them. And, uh, and this has also been shown a lot in Australia. And there are some, some mycophagous mammals that are highly specialized and really feeding almost exclusively on truffles or, or very heavily on truffles. Others, uh, Ryan Stevens, who I saw in the audience has done some work showing that generalists are really underestimated, but they're also really important for dispersal of ectomycorrhizal fungi in many systems as well. So when we think about how truffles are getting around, we think about mammals and we think about odor. Uh, and of course we know from like, this is a great movie I've heard about and I haven't gotten a chance to see, but we know that humans are also relatively obsessed with some of the odors that come from these, right? We don't just pay a, a zillion dollars for these white truffles just because, it's because they smell so great and people love the way they taste. So there's, there, we know that odor is involved. When you go out in a forest and you want to collect truffles in the northern hemisphere, you go and you follow the mammals. So in this case, uh, one, of the, one of the techniques that Jim Trappy taught me is that you go and you look for the animal digs and you follow the squirrels around and you're going to find truffles in that way. But when you go to South America and you go to forests that are quite different and have a different evolutionary history, it turns out that technique is, it doesn't work very well because there's not really any squirrels there. And so uh, when I first started to go to Chile, I saw these patterns in the forest that were really different. This is um, showing a picture of a, a little hill here. And at the bottom of the hill, you can see all this leaf litter that's been disturbed, some truffles that have been displaced that are, that are at the bottom. And there's Marcos for scale at the top. And, um, and this is interesting because this is not really what you see uh, when you go out in forests in the Northern hemisphere. This example right here, I, I promise I didn't set it up. This is what it looked like when I walked up into the forest and I found it. It looked like a chicken had been to work uh, looking for you know whatever there was to eat inside of that soil and it liked that one spot in the middle. So it looks different from what you see in the Northern hemisphere. The other thing you see sometimes is quite often you'll see truffles moved around and then you'll see pieces of them missing like are shown in this picture right here. And the other thing that's quite notable is that in Patagonia, in Southern South America, some truffles seem to use these, uh, or at least anecdotally, seem to use sort of visual cues to find truffles, whoever's looking for them. You see these resemblances that are really strong. So these Cystangium uh, nothophagy, which are shown intermixed here with berries of Gualtheria, they're found in the same places, all, all on the ground in the same habitats. And, and similarly, at the same sites, you also find this other um, berry, which is Empetrum rubrum, and it's right intermixed with the truffles of Holingia purpurea. So you don't have to use too much imagination to see there's, they're similar in size and they're similar in shape as well. We also uh, see some truffles that look like other things, like these Rulandiella patagonica, which are small gelatinous little truffles, look pretty similar to this snail egg. And this cystangium here, uh, nothophagy, looks pretty similar to this dreamus winter eye seed. So you see some resemblance visually, which is like, oh, that's really strange. That's not something you would expect to see, uh, especially not in the Northern hemisphere if the animals are using olfactory cues. Uh, this is not something you would expect to see. Another thing which, which I had noted for a long time, which is quite unusual, is seeing this, which is truffles that have been exposed and then look like they've been pecked at. Um, that's not something I had seen before I went to Chile. And here's just three different species of Hypogeus coordinarius and one Holingius or, or Hysterangium species 
with this same uh, sort of henpecked little look to it. And that's sort of unusual. So I, Marcos and I were both really interested in this. And we uh, took that opportunity to start really a project just on this to try to follow up on these observations. And so I'm just generally the goal was to document the role of birds in dispersing fungal spores in these Nothophagaceae forests in Chile. And specifically, we wanted to test sort of straightforward hypotheses, uh, sequencing DNA from these fecal samples to identify the pool of fungi. And we assumed that they were going to be ectomycorrhizal fungi and also uh, truffles would be prominent among them. And the other thing we wanted to do is to follow up and make sure that there's at least, uh, they're likely to be viable. So using fluorescence microscopy to, to sort of assess the viability or likely viability of these spores. And to do this, we focus on two really common ground foraging birds. Uh, one is called the chukau and one is called the wet wet. So the chukau is shown at the top there and the chukaus are, are pretty small, 18 centimeters. They're uh, really common. And uh, they, the, both of these birds you can find throughout the Nothophagaceae forest. The wet wet is a little bit bigger. It's, it's got these nice big uh, feet that look a little bit like truffle rakes. So I was immediately attracted to that, that guy. And I'm gonna show you some more pictures of them in video in a second. And so we wanted to focus on these because they are widespread and you can find them across a very wide area. And when I mean wide area, uh, this is just an image to kind of capture that. So Nothophagaceae forests, roughly stretching from uh, Santiago all the way to the tip of South America, so around 1,500 kilometers. And over most of that area, they're co-occurring with these two birds. Now, these birds are not requiring Nothophagaceae forests, but they're very common throughout this shared range. They're really common in forests that have Nothophagaceae. You can find them without Nothophagaceae, but they're common in these forests. And when I say common, just, just to, to get outside of the Northern Hemisphere perspective, I wanna be clear that this is the example of chukaus. Chukaus are common enough in, in the Southern part of Chile that you see things like t-shirts with them. There's a kid's book here. This is a greeting card. This is a restaurant that's right out, um, sort of within 10 kilometers or, or so of some of the sites where we worked where chukaus figure uh, prominently because they are really distinctive and noticeable and common birds in this kind of, uh, in, in these habitats. So I'm just gonna show just very brief videos to show you that they're, they're on the ground and they're not too afraid of humans. Uh, just, you can see they're commonly foraging on the ground. They're looking for all kinds of stuff in there. You can see they are removing the litter there in the case of the chukau on the left. On the right, you're gonna see the wet wet come in and you can see, oop, I didn't like that. Let's try that again. Uh, we're gonna try it one more time. Here we go. Okay, you can see the wet wet uh, has these big, big feet and he's using them to, he or she is using them to rake those leaves. Let's look at it again. You can see there's litter flying. So it doesn't take too much imagination uh, to see how these guys are functioning. Okay, and so, of course, because they're birds, people know something about them. And so there's actually been some diet studies. So I'm gonna highlight this one diet study of, of the wet wet here, shown there's the wet wet. And this is by Correa et al, two, uh, sorry, 1990. And you can see the main diet was thought to be invertebrates and seeds. But the problem is for a lot of these studies, uh, when, you're, when you're dealing with stomach contents, that limits how many birds you can look at because you have to kill the birds to look inside their stomachs. But also, um, they're usually sieving the contents of the stomachs and then using a dissecting microscope to look at what's left. So if something has a soft body or it has very microscopic small spores, you're not going to see it with this kind of a method. So it's not surprising to, to, you know, to find out that no fungi were previously detected in the diets of these birds. Um, so Marcos and I and, and some collaborators wanted to study this. So we went to sites, uh, sites across this part of Chile. So this area spans about 700 kilometers. In the south, you're, you're really talking about uh, very much within Patagonia, very cold, very cold temperate climate. Up near the northern sites, you're getting close to Chile's Mediterranean zone. So it's a lot warmer and a lot drier in those habitats. And then sites spread across this, this whole region. 
Uh, and so I want to just show you a couple pictures of what these look like, because probably many of you have not been had a chance to go to Nothofagaceae forest. So I'm just going to briefly show uh, here's some evergreen forests. There's some that are uh, mixed, but primarily deciduous forests. And you can see there's all kinds of different forests, and they're they're really um, going all the way from sea level all the way to tree line. So uh, some of these shots are, are showing the tree line, which is Nothofagaceae forest right up to the tree line. And in many cases, these birds are pretty close up to the tree line and all the way down to the sea level. So here's some snow in the alpine zone there. And you can see the, the picture on the top is, is more of a woodland. It's getting close to where Chile's Mediterranean climate uh, really officially begins. Okay, so you can see these are really vast forests. They're common and they cover this whole area. So we wanted to collect fecal material from these birds. And we had sort of two main methods for doing that. One is the birds were captured with a net, right, like this, and then put into a cloth bag and just held in the bag until they left a fecal deposit. So that I'll call active collecting. The second method, because that takes a long time, is very intensive. We also did sort of some passive collecting of fecal material. So what that means is we're out there, we're in the habitat, we know there's the birds around, we're, we're watching them in many cases, and we know where they are, so we go and we collect fecal material from the ground. But on all those fecal materials that were collected from the ground, we always took a soil sample right below it as sort of a passive control. And then we also sequenced either the CO1 or NADH uh, genes for to verify the identity of the birds using bird-specific primers. So I'm not going to go into detail, but basically this is a way to make sure that we're dealing with fecal material from the birds that we think we're dealing with. And I'm also not going to go into great detail about the molecular data from the fecal samples because I think this is pretty standard at this point using aluminum I seek in this case and uh, we're, we're amplifying the ITS-1 and we're using protocols that have really been worked out, especially by Michelle. She is, a, she is our, our local expert for bioinformatics and so we use the AMTK pipeline for that. And then we also needed to, to look at the actual samples themselves using microscopy. This is a relatively straightforward approach where we suspended them in water, we sieved the samples to get out debris, we centrifuged, and then we visualized them. And so for identification or verification of identity of the fungal spores, we use sort of standard DIC microscopy. And then for epifluorescence, we use this stained propidium iodide, which um, I'm giving you the reference there in case you want to check it out. I'm going to show some images of that in a minute. Okay, so what did we find? Um, the fungal communities in the feces and the soil are shown in this NMDS. And the main important take home message, the bird uh, fecal samples are in, are in red and blue. And the main take home message, I'm gonna circle it for you, is that poop and soil are different from each other. And that's interesting and necessary for two reasons. One is it shows that uh, when poop is being deposited on soil, it's bringing in a new fungal community that wasn't necessarily there to begin with. And that those fungi from the soil are not the fungi that we're finding in these poop samples. So they're not contaminants from soil. And to, and to screen that one step further, um, here's what we did. When we had individual samples, they were paired. And any sample where a fungus was found in both a fecal sample and a, uh, and a soil sample, we subtracted that fungus from our, our uh, data set for those particular pairs so that we wouldn't be influenced by things that might have been contaminants from soil into the poop samples accidentally. So we, so we took a conservative approach and we subtracted those, and that's important, just so you know that these are legitimate data that are really from those fecal samples. Okay, so then we have our whole fungal communities and, and we have more than 100 different fecal samples in here. They were sampled from across those 11 sites that I showed you. So here's the map here and it's color coded and this NMDS uh, shows you this nice rainbow. And the reason it shows you this nice rainbow here is because you see that geography highly influences the fungal communities that are in these feces. This is incidentally what you would expect if uh, some of the pattern was coming from the, the things that these birds are eating when they're available. They, the same fungi aren't necessarily available throughout this whole area over all the times that we were sampling. And this is all the data for both the birds together. So you find a strong pattern of geography. Uh, it's pretty distinctive and you can see it there visually. 
We also went to look within those individual samples in just in terms of the ectomycorrhizal, the number of ectomycorrhizal reads from each sample. And sort of the take home message from that is that, you know, you get this wide variation where you have some samples with very low uh, percentage of reads, but then others you can see up here where you have particular fecal samples that are dominated by ectomycorrhizal fungi to the point that they're almost 100% of the reads of fungi from these samples are ectomycorrhizal, which to me was very convincing. I know that there's issues of read abundance, but when you get almost 100% of this, uh, the sample dominated by ectomycorrhizal fungi, and then you look at it under the microscope and it's chock full of spores of ectomycorrhizal fungi, that's very convincing, at least for me it was. So hopefully you'll be convinced too. Um, and then the other thing we did was we looked at the diversity of these fungi just to see what the structure looked like generally. And then, uh, so for each of the different groups here, we're showing sort of the frequency of occurrence of each of these different groups in, in the fecal samples, and they're separated by bird species. So the chukaus are in blue and the wet wets are in red. And then if you look at all the ectomycorrhizal fungi together, basically the, the take home message is more than 80% of the fecal samples have at least one ectomycorrhizal fungi. And of course, many of them have multiple ectomycorrhizal fungi. And this is particularly striking for some groups like Inosobi and Cortinarius, almost 50% of all samples uh, have at least one Cortinarius for both bird species. So that's pretty impressive. Um, and so you can see there's a bunch of different uh, lineages represented. Many of them form mushrooms and truffles that we know about. Um, some of them don't. So we, we don't really know how those spores ended up there, but we know that a lot of the ones that are in this top area are forming fruiting bodies. And then you can look at this another way, uh, whether you look at it in terms of the number of ectomycorrhizal OTUs, so the sort of diversity for each of the different groups, or the percentage of the ectomycorrhizal sequence reads, another pattern really clearly emerges. I think you can probably see it from space because it's so obvious. And that is that you get this really big dominance of by Cortinarius. And this is what you expect based on what I told you about the fruiting bodies that you find in these environments. So whether you look by number of species or you look by the number of reeds, it's pretty impressive. And you can see some other groups are also important. Inosobi is shown there uh, as number two using both of those methods. Um, and then another thing that emerges that's really quite, quite nice is that the birds clearly consume truffles. And so this is just showing you a bunch of different, uh, because we've collected truffles in these environments, you can see there's a lot of different truffles there arrayed across the bottom. Many of them are consumed by both birds. There are some that are definitely only consumed uh, in our data set by wet, wet, although of course some of this has to do with sampling issues. But you can see there's just a lot of truffles there. And these are the ones that we know because we've collected them and we've sequenced them. There are probably more that we don't have sequences of, so we can't be sure they're truffles. And just to give you a visual of what that looks like, they're from different groups um, and, and they're from different lineages of fungi. And, and so in this case, they're shown with the fruiting body that we have a collection of, or one of them, and then also the spores. And yes, these spores are actually from real fecal samples. It wasn't like we took a section from the fruiting body and cheated. These are, this shows you how you can actually find these spores in the fecal material. So, so this is a real pattern and it's been verified with visuals as well. Over the process of doing this, we also made direct observations of mycophagy, especially for some of the common things. So this is uh, Cystangium nothophagii that's going to keep coming up here because it's so common. It's definitely the most common truffle in many of the places. And you can see that's a wet wet uh, that's actually eating a truffle. And thanks to Yitzi for the, capturing that picture because they don't sit around and wait for you to photograph them. Uh, so it's hard to get pictures like that. Another really interesting surprise uh, during this process, I told you Inosobi was important both in terms of number of species that we find in the fecal material and also the total number of reeds. But we also find that we can find spores of these in the, in the fecal material. And in this case, actually a cystidium of an Inosobi that made it all the way through the digestive system of this bird. And for some of these, we've been able to to determine that these are gastroid inosomy species. And so uh, Marcos actually just, and I, and Brandon Matheny just published a paper describing some of those. And incidentally, all but one of the, uh, 
fungi that have been described as sequestrate, inosophy, are all from the southern hemisphere. There's only one that's really known from the entire northern hemisphere. So there's a biogeographical pattern here as well. Okay, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to wrap up here pretty quick. But I, and I'm going to diverge briefly just to say that uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi are not the only fungi that are in these samples. And in this case, we quantified the AM fungi DNA. Because of the way we did our sieving, we weren't really looking for AM spores. And of course, they're much bigger. So we didn't really verify these visually. But you can see that approximately between 40 and 50% of all the samples have some evidence of DNA from AM fungi. Uh, and they're spread across multiple groups. And I think another thing that's interesting about this, particularly given we were talking about AM fungi yesterday, is that I think that this, this northern temperate bias about what AM fungi look like might come into play a little because there are a number of sporocarpic um, glomeromycotina that form these really quite big fruiting bodies. And so we think some of this, some of these AM fungi are likely purposeful ingestion of AM fungi as food products. We can't really show that except for just one of the matches because of bioinformatics issues, but um, I'm pretty convinced that that's the case. And also as an aside, for people who are interested in genomes of AM fungi, they should talk to me because I find that these are not uncommon and they, they produce a lot of tissue. So I, I think that's a one potentially useful way to get genomes from these, these fungi. Um, and also, I, just to go back to say that I, I told you that we did viability tests using ep, uh, epifluorescence microscopy with propidium iodide. And this is in collaboration with Ann Wilkies from uh, UF Soil and Water Science, who was really helpful to Marcos in his project. Um, so what you can see shown on the left there is just sort of this, the span of them. So there are some where you get relatively low viability, but most of them, it's around 50% of the spores are viable. And you, you do this staining so you can see these are viable over here and these on the left are, are, are not viable. So I'm going to show a couple of images just to give you an idea of what that looks like. So here's a bunch of spores taken from a fecal sample. Also keep in mind that these samples had to be preserved and dried and transported and stained. So there are several opportunities for decreasing viability. I would say 50% is what we're finding, but it might be quite hot, a bit higher if these were fresh samples that didn't need to be stored and transported. Um, so this is what it looks like when you're looking at the light microscope. This is what it looks like under fluorescence. And you can see some of those spores are fluorescing. That means that they're not intact. So the DNA is being stained. So those we infer to be dead. The ones on the right over there, they are inferred to be alive. I'm going to show you again with the circles so you can see the difference. So anything that's not taking up the stain is inferred to be intact and therefore viable. So I think, I think this is pretty good evidence that at least some of those spores are viable. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, I hope I've convinced you that both the cows and the wet wets eat these diverse ectomycorrhizal fungi and other fungi as well. It's, it's pretty clear based on our sampling, which was not complete across the range of both birds, but covers a very wide area, that this is a common and widespread occurrence. Uh, and I think the truffle spores in the fecal material really indicates active foraging that's going on below ground. After you see that video of the wet wet, it's probably not hard to convince yourself that they are actively foraging and that's why they're getting truffles. And, uh, you know, most of them or, or about half of them are, are viable or we think that they're viable. And of course, we think this very likely has an impact on downstream on the, the fungal communities that are being influenced by these birds. Uh, unfortunately, we were supposed to go last year back to do more experiments, and we were supposed to go this year to do more experiments. And uh, now Marcus is graduating and life goes on because COVID-19 derailed everyone. But we do hope to continue work in this system because I think it's really interesting and has a lot of opportunity for learning by having a different view uh, of how things might be. And this is one aspect that I think would be really cool to follow up on. I think birds may change our view of truffle foraging. So this is Cystangium nothophagii here. And then when you look at Cystangium nothophagii under a black light, you see this uh, fluorescence that's going on. And you can see different truffles in that group are fluorescing slightly differently. The large ones are different from the smaller ones, suggesting that they may change in this fluorescence as they mature. We don't have enough data to say, but I think there's some potentially interesting aspects here. So. I think there's a lot to follow up on with this work. 
And I just want to say thank you to a lot of people. I won't name them all. I will specifically say thanks to Fundacion uh, Fungi and Juliana Furci, um, as well as Don and Roseanne Healy. And, uh, and then, of course, members of the Smith Lab who've been really helpful and supportive, and many others uh, in South America who've been supportive of this work and have really contributed in various ways to it. And also, we've been lucky to have funding for this work from uh, NSF, but also from National Geographic and several other institutions. And I will leave you uh, with just one thing to think about, is that how we think about the world might impact what we look for. And you might want to consider whether you're a Northern Hemispherist, because I find that I am, and I'm trying to be aware of that. So thank you very much. <laughs>